Hear now this reading from the seventh chapter of the book of John. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let anyone who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, Out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no Spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some in the crowd said, This is really the prophet. Others said, This is the Messiah. But some asked, Surely the Messiah does not come from Galilee, does he? Has not the scripture said that the Messiah is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? So there was division in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. <clears throat> Friday night, the confirmation class took a retreat. We went to Elizabeth Warren's farm in Red Oak, Iowa to learn about God, creation, and God's covenant with us to help care for the earth. Unfortunately, it was cold and windy most of the time that we were there, limiting the amount of time that we could actually spend outside in nature as we had planned to. But I did have a lovely moment on Saturday morning. Elizabeth and I were the only ones awake and up at that point. We were having our first cup of coffee and you're standing in Elizabeth's kitchen pouring the coffee. You look toward the east-facing window, and I happened to look up at that very moment you know, when the sun broke above the horizon line. And it cast a tangerine-colored orange glow all over the farm. Quite pretty. So I pulled up a chair beside that window, drank that first cup of coffee in peace, and watched the sun rise and the birds play in the trees. A moment ago, Mark read the poem At the River Clarion by Mary Oliver. The poem comes from her book entitled Evidence, which I think is a most intriguing title because it leaves you wondering, evidence for what? For God, for goodness, for beauty, for meaning, for all of the above? I'm not quite sure. There's a quote at the beginning of the book from the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard we create ourselves by our choices. Does Mary Oliver think that we have to choose to see evidence of love, goodness, and God? The book's first poem is entitled Yellow, and it's quite short. There is the heaven we enter through institutional grace, and there are the yellow finches bathing and singing in the lowly puddle. We learn about grace from the doctrines of the church, and we experience it when we watch the birds. That's one reason we take the confirmation class to Elizabeth's farm for those particular lessons. It's one thing to talk about God as creator and our role in caring for the earth. It's another thing to have a little experience of nature, to feed the horse, to see the routines of the farm. In the poem Mark read, Mary Oliver can't tell you for certain who God is or even if God exists, but she does know something about the beauty and goodness of the river and how it contributes to the meaning of life. She does know that if God exists, then God is everywhere, and that is in some way important. She writes, Yes, it could be that I am a tiny piece of God, and each of you too, or at least of his intention and his hope, which is a delight beyond measure. And I think in a similar line of thought, Jesus said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink, for out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. And the author of the gospel informs us that he said this about the Spirit. Father Richard Rohr wrote that the Holy Spirit is that aspect of God that works largely from within and secretly at the deepest levels of our desiring. If we are thirsty, then we must drink from the living water that flows from out of our own hearts. And this 
is the Spirit of God. Father Rohr is one of the best-selling spiritual writers today. He's a Franciscan priest who lit, makes his home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In 2011, he wrote a book entitled Falling Upward, a, spiritu a Spirituality for the Two Halves of Life. The basic message of this book is that real spiritual growth and wisdom occur in what he calls the second half of life. During the first half of life, we are generally focused on giving shape to who we are. We pursue our education and our careers. We form intimate relationships that help to define us. We are often ambitious and driven. And these things, he says, are all good and necessary. Now, common wisdom is that in the second half of life, we diminish. Age slows us down physically and mentally, and we begin to retire from much that engaged us in early life. However, Father Rohr thinks that the common wisdom is wrong, that the true journey of the second half of life is not a diminishment, but a broadening of perspective, a gaining of true wisdom and insight. Somewhere along the way, often after a real crisis in our lives, which brings us suffering, we begin a second journey. At least spiritually healthy people begin the second journey. And he calls it falling upward. In the second half of life, we cease to, fo cease to focus our attention on what was good and necessary in the first half of life, career, ambition, accomplishing all those goals, we aren't as concerned with following the rules. We care less about whether we get our way. We don't worry as much about what other people think of us. And we no longer want to waste time on the people and things that don't enrich us. We begin to detach from the things that used to concern us. And instead, we focus on the deepest desires of our hearts, our true self, our home, which he believes is God's spirit within us. Part of this journey is learning to let go of our ego and our desire to get everything right. He writes that we grow spiritually much more by doing it wrong than by doing it right. And he explains, if there is such a thing as human perfection, it seems to emerge precisely from how we handle the imperfection that is everywhere, especially our own. What a clever place for God to hide holiness so that only the humble and the earnest will find it. We can choose to beat ourselves up over our limitations and our failings, or we can choose to see that even in our imperfections, the grace of God indwells us, that there is a spirit inside each of us which can heal us. So healing, our theme for this Lent, begins when we realize that the power to heal belongs to us already. It's that divine spark that we all share. And once we realize that we are a tiny piece of God, then we can begin to accept ourselves and to forgive ourselves. And the forgiveness can remove shame and guilt and release us from some of our fears and anxieties. We are set free into a new peace and joy that can be a delight beyond measure. Now, Father Rohr describes this process as coming home. And one important set of moral and health issues facing the United States is the homecoming of our veterans. We have seen alarming rates of veteran suicide and mental health issues in recent years. And we have a much greater appreciation for the role that post-traumatic stress disorder plays in the lives of many of our veterans. While helping veterans coming home again, some theologians have begun to explore what is called moral injury. As Rita Nakashima Brock explains it, moral injury is the result of reflection on memories of war, and it comes from having transgressed one's basic moral identity and violated core moral beliefs. Veterans with moral injury feel they no longer live in a reliable, meaningful world. Now, moral injury and PTSD are not the same thing. A person can suffer from one and not the other, but they are often linked. 
Most of our soldiers and sailors are motivated to enter the service because of their deeply held moral beliefs. Military service promotes the virtues of integrity and courage, personal discipline, humility, a sense of purpose and responsibility, and a commitment for the lives of others. Yet combat veterans are also called upon to kill other human beings. And most report that in the moment, on the battlefield, there's not time to think and to consider. One simply responds to one's training and the need to defend oneself and one's friends. It's often later, especially when soldiers return home, that they have to reflect, and this reflection can lead to this feeling that one has violated core moral beliefs, that there's been a serious conflict between one's moral duties. This can be particularly difficult when one returns to a society in which the majority of us did not sacrifice during the war, but continued living our lives as if nothing had happened. Veteran Mac Bicca has written, healing and coming home from war are difficult, complex, and perilous journeys of introspection and understanding. Those who work with veterans now realize that we need to offer opportunities for soul repair. This is a new area in theological ethics, but already we have learned a little bit of what it requires of us. The larger society needs to be aware of the issue and empathetic toward our veterans. We also need to take responsibility for our own actions and how war affects our lives and our morality. And we should also learn to give veterans the space they need to work with each other in the healing process. One thing I've personally heard from many combat veterans is that they have to help each other, that they can't and don't want to open up to those of us who haven't served. But we should befriend them as they are on this journey. For veterans, coming home is a journey of healing that involves reconnecting with their deep moral core, their true self. They must nurture each other's humanity and offer each other grace. In this way, the soul is repaired, and that tiny piece of God inside us all can once again become the source of delight. And what is true about healing in this particular instance for veterans is really true for all of us. Healing begins when we realize that the power to heal belongs to us already. It is the Holy Spirit of God already inside of us. For Jesus said, Let anyone who is thirsty come, and let the one who believes in me drink. For out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water.